So we'll get to SpaceX in a moment, but first of all, tell us about how many times you've gone up into space and what that experience was like for you. Oh, well, I've, I went up two times on the space shuttle, first in 2008 and then in 2010, and I highly recommend it. <laughs> it was <laughs> phenomenal. I had a great time up there. Tell What was your role on those missions? Well, Joe, on, on uh, the first mission, I was going up to be a, a long-duration crew member on the International Space Station. I spent about uh, three months up there, came home on the Space Shuttle Discovery. And then my second mission, I went up with the crew of Atlantis. And during that time, we were constructing the space station. So I did three spacewalks, operated the space station robot arm, and I was a flight engineer on Space Shuttle Atlantis. And what's it like going out on one of those spacewalks? <laughs> Well, yeah, that's the greatest life experience you can have, I think, when you're up there in space. Uh, when you're floating out there, it, it's a strange combination of the familiar and the outlandish. When you're working out there, everything is in its place. Uh, the tools all work as, as similar to your training. Uh, but then you look over your shoulder and you see all of Australia fly right on by, <laughs> and that's crazy. <laughs> Pretty magic. Now, you've also worked with SpaceX in a really senior role. Uh, give us an insight in, as to how SpaceX works and how significant is this Starship project? Yes, I, I spent seven years there and in, in uh, working to get ready to fly people on our Falcon 9 rocket and our Crew Dragon. And I can tell you that what was very different about being at SpaceX compared to being at NASA or some of the traditional aerospace companies was the decision speed and the pace at which we moved. We moved very, very quickly. And the idea was that, hey, let's make a decision today and go try something. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. And that was hard to do at NASA because we didn't have the agility that SpaceX enjoys. So if SpaceX realizes that something's wrong, they can very rapidly fix it and move on. Uh, that was not something that's at uh, NASA with a lot of large contractors, complex contracts. That was not something that we could do. And were you comfortable moving so quickly after having worked at NASA? Did it feel a little weird? And uh, were there some situations where SpaceX was moving too quickly? Now, honestly, it, it felt very liberating yeah. <laughs> you know, after moving very slowly. Uh, and and uh, the thing that, that SpaceX does very well is they create an, a, an environment during the development of a new vehicle like Starship where the consequences of failure are very low. Uh, for example, today, nobody got hurt, even though that rocket did blow up spectacularly. We did lose that rocket, but you know what? We have uh, more rockets waiting uh, in the hangar, ready to go uh, for, you know, within months, we can be flying them again. So really, the consequences of this failure are minor, but the benefit is major because of everything that they learned it's the same process that SpaceX uh, followed when we tried to figure out how to land our Falcon 9 rocket on the ship at sea or back on land and be able to reuse it. We had nothing to lose because we were throwing them away anyway. So we took very large risks when the consequences of failure were low uh, so that we could figure out all the things that could go wrong, fix them, so that when the consequences of failure are high, like when my friends are sitting on top of that rocket, the risk was very low. Yeah, we could see people cheering there even as the rocket exploded, I think. So you, you would still describe this as a su success? Yeah, absolutely. I, there are some problematic things, of course. Uh, the, the most problematic, in my opinion, is the damage done at the launch site. I think that's going to be one of the hardest things to recover from. Uh, the other problems we had were failures of individual engines uh, and then a failure of the two vehicles to separate, the upper stage and the lower stage. And I believe SpaceX will very quickly figure out what caused those problems. And I think they'll be able to fix those things without too much trouble. Yeah, so you mentioned the damage done at the launch site. Is that just damage that naturally occurs with every launch or was there something that went wrong at the actual set the, at the moment of launch? Well, it's, it's, it's so to put this into context, this rocket uh, is about twice as big as the biggest rocket we've ever flown. Yeah. So the biggest rocket that we ever successfully launched was the SLS rocket, which is about a million pounds at launch of thrust, greater than the Saturn V, which is the previous record holder. And this rocket is about twice that. So when you have that much energy uh, coming out, you, you, you can do all the modeling in the world, but until you actually light those engines, it's hard to know exactly how much debris that's gonna kick up, right. and how much force and energy is going to release onto the structures around it. So we found out and it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. And so you mentioned the, the two other things, uh, two other issues uh, mid-flight or it got to about four minutes. Just take us through the specifics of what, what went wrong. 
Well, there are 33 engines in that first stage, which is a lot. And uh, I think three of them failed to, to light right off the pad. So right in the beginning, you were, we were only launching with 30 of the 33. And then additional ones were lost. And you can see in the video that some of them came apart pretty dramatically uh, al along the way up. So at the end, we, we were short about, I think, about six engines uh, at, the, at the point when the first stage had, was complete. Uh, I noticed that the altitude it reached was lower than what we had expected. So I think that, you know, it's possible that the reason that they didn't separate uh, successfully was that they, they were going through much thicker air than anticipated uh, at that lower altitude. The dynamic pressure or the force of the wind, if you will, was higher probably than they designed for. That might have something to do with it or it might be a mechanical failure. I don't have access to the immediate access to the data anymore. I kind of missed that. Uh, uh, but uh, but all my friends back at SpaceX do, and I'm sure they probably already know uh, what really went wrong. Yeah, it sounds like you still have a pretty good insight <laughs> into it all. And so was <laughs> it uh, purposefully uh, um, brought down or was it the fact that the, the kind of rockets exploded? Uh, no, it was exploded on purpose to, <laughs> to safeguard uh, any uh, uninvolved members of the public on the ground. Uh, that's all. All of these rockets carry explosives, and if something goes wrong, uh, those explosives are detonated to make sure before the rocket could possibly travel beyond a certain range where it's where it could possibly hurt somebody. So it's over the Gulf of Mexico, over the water, uh, and and those explosives are detonated intentionally before it could possibly reach reach land and hurt somebody. Even the space shuttle had those explosives on it, and there was an individual that had the big red button to push if we were veering off course. And we used to go visit that individual before launch with pictures of our family, our children, <laughs> and just the hope that they give us, you know, one more second before they hit that button. <laughs> you, you were never the person holding the big red button? No, that was not my job. That was, I was, I was in there uh, hoping that he doesn't push it. Uh, <laughs> so I was on the other end. <laughs> So uh, re remind us, uh, Garrett, what the ultimate aim of the Starship project is and when you think the next, next launch could be taking into account what happened today. Well, the ultimate aim of the Starship uh, program is to make human life multiplanetary, which is incredibly grandiose and ambitious. But there are three things about this vehicle that are revolutionary and make it possible that it could actually achieve that goal. The first is the scale. This is a monster rocket, and it could carry potentially up to about 100 people. Wow. I think it'll be a little bit less than that, but, but theoretically up to 100 people. Keep in mind that the largest number of people we've ever launched on a single rocket, in, in, which was in the space shuttle, was eight. So going from eight to 100, that's the, an idea of the scale. Uh, the other thing about it is it's designed to be 100% reusable so that we're going to get the, the, the booster back and we're also going to get that Starship on top, the, the silver part and the black part that you see on the screen, and be able to fill it up with gas and use them again, which would revolutionize the economics of space flight. You know, when I was flying on the space shuttle, it cost about $50,000 per pound uh, to get something to space. This, it might be able to drop that price down to about $100 per pound. So all kinds of things that would be cost prohibitive might be possible now in space. And finally, once it's circling the Earth, that black starship, that is, it, it's, its gas tanks will be empty. And it only has enough to just come home and not really go beyond low Earth orbit, just like the space shuttle. Uh, it was the same way. We couldn't take the space shuttle to the moon, for example. But starship is different because it's designed to be refuelable on orbit. So we can launch tanker ships, fill up those gas tanks again, and then we can take those 100 people and that giant starship and really, once its tanks are full, send it anywhere in the solar system, including Mars. Wow. Garrett, you are still so passionate about this all. <laughs> and you were, sounds like you really enjoyed working at SpaceX. I've got, I've got to ask the question, what, why aren't you still there? <laughs> well, it was, it was exciting. There's no question. It was extremely intense. Uh, in, in a lot of good ways, as you can tell, and on days like this, it's, it's still a thrill to be, have, have been associated and continue to be associated with the company. But there are long, very difficult days, too. It's, it's yeah. not a place for the uh, faint of heart. So I thought it was time for my, me to move on and hand over the reins to somebody a, a little bit a little bit fresher, a little bit younger, perhaps. Well, I'm glad we've got access to you to talk, to talk about it. It's been so good having a chat to you today about this. Thanks so much for talking to us, Dr. Garrett Reisman there in Los Angeles. My pleasure, Joe.